Okay, um, I don't want to wait too long. We've got a pretty good crowd at the minute. Um, so let's get started. Um, again, hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, to what I hope is the first iteration of a very exciting series um, called Conversations with Collectors. Uh, my name is Marjorie Rawl. I am the Associate Gallery Director of Assembly. Um, I'm really excited to be joined um, by one of our artists today, Vasantha Yoganathan, uh, whose exhibition, um, A Myth of Two Souls, is on view at our gallery um, in Houston right now, um, and is the topic of our discussion today. Um, I'm also so thrilled um, that we're able to have Vasantha today in conversation with Anjali Patel and Parambir Kayla, um, who are author or authors. Uh, collectors based in Toronto um, and also collectors of Vasanta's work. Um, so I think it's going to be a really engaging conversation. Um, I'm going to just offer some really brief introductions to our amazing panelists um, in case you are less familiar with them. Um, and then I'll turn it over to them for the conversation. Um, so Vasanta Yoganathan is a French artist whose photographic practice addresses the space between documentary and fiction. Using natural light and analog processes, he perceives photography as a malleable material open to interpretations. The book has been central to his work since the beginning. In 2014, he co-founded the publishing house Shows Commune, and he published his first book, Pied Manson, uh, in 2014. In his books, he interweaves staged photography with scenes from everyday life, thus exploring different forms of photographic storytelling. He has received several awards, um, including the Ideas Tap Magnum Photos Award in 2015 and an ICP Infinity Award um, as the Emerging Photographer of the Year in 2017. His work has been collected internationally uh, by major institutions such as the Victorian Albert Museum in London, the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, um, and the Chanel Nexus Hall in Tokyo. Um, Anjali Patel and Parambir Kayla are collectors who live in Toronto. Their collection focuses on contemporary artists of the South Asian diaspora. They began collecting in December 2010 and have acquired nearly 80 works at this point. Um, they consider collecting to be a form of seva, a Sanskrit and Punjabi word meaning service, um, because it directly impacts artists. Um, Santa, Anjali, and uh, Parambir. Sorry, can everyone still hear me? I got a notification yes. that I've been signed out of the account. Okay, <laughs> that, that didn't actually happen. Um, <laughs> thank you all of you uh, for being here. Um, and just one last note for me, I'll promise I will stop talking soon. Uh, there will be time for audience questions at the end. Um, so if you would like to submit a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, please do so. And I will read them uh, to our panelists at the end. Um, okay, and I'm gonna share my screen so that we have images to go along with our conversation um, in just a minute. Let's see. Actually, I'm going to let you guys start the conversation because sure. I'm clear okay. technical difficulties over here, but image is coming soon. <laughs> sure. No worries. Thank you for those lovely introductions. Marjorie, yes, thank you. It's so great to be here with you, both of you, uh, Marjorie and Vasantha. So I guess without further ado, we'll get started. And uh, we felt a good place to start would be um, to ask you what the Ramayan is. So a myth of two souls is inspired by this ancient Indian tale. And maybe you can give us a quick recap of the story for audience members who are less familiar with this incredible tale. Yeah, well, it's a very, very long book. So doing a quick recap is not that easy, but basically sure. the Ramayana is about a prince, Rama and a princess, Sita. Um, they fall in love, they get married, and then they get banished from their kingdom following a political um, intrigue. And during the banishment, they go through all sorts of adventures. Um, they cross the jungle. They go from the north of India to the south of India. Uh, Sita gets abducted by the king of Sri Lanka. Uh, Rama tried to look for Sita, and so many, many things happen, uh, are happening. Um, we have animals as well, with uh, magic, 
Uh, it's a blend of um, a story that is very done to earth in the sense that it addresses um, feelings and emotions that all of us human beings uh, can or will feel in our lives, uh, family, love, uh, brotherhood, many human relationships uh, are at play in the text. And there's also um, another side of it that is uh, very magical and very beautiful where like uh, the world of the gods and the world of the humans um, interacts with each other. It's not two worlds that are um, uh, separated from each other. They crisscross um, many times during the epic. And um, it's a very ancient uh, text. It's believed to be like around like 2000 years old. So it's, this is also why the Ramayan is um, believed by many scholars to be one of the founding um, texts for Hinduism and the basis of many of the most important um, social um, status that, that are still at play in, in contemporary India today. So the text is not only an important old tradition, but it's also a living body uh, that is, um, yeah, that is very, very important to the Indian society today. Lovely. Uh, Vasanta, can you actually tell us, or do you recall your first encounter with this uh, story? Yeah, um, so my father is from Sri Lanka. He came to France um, when he was 16 years old and I was born in the south of France in a small town where there was not any, um, there wasn't a diaspora there. Like, so there was no Sri Lankan or in the Indian community. Um, so my father, as many other, um, the first wave of immigration to France, the people were taught that in order to become French, they had to blend in and kind of lose their identity. Things are very different now, but like his way of, I guess his way of being French was to give us a very French education. And so I was not very connected to my uh, Sri Lankan roots, uh, but I remember very well that he had a collection of comic books um, and among, amongst the Indian comic books uh, was the Ramayana uh, version of the comic books, which is still today in India, I think maybe one of the most popular uh, version of the Ramayana because it's, it's the one that kids can read very easily because like it's full of pictures and um, it's also a simplified version of course because it's only a comic book. So it's, it's quite small and quite short. Um, and it was uh, written in English, so I couldn't read it. But like, I remember the pictures very vividly. It's, it's, it's sometimes it's strange because you remember things from your childhood that you didn't really understand at the time, but somehow they stuck with you and they follow you on. So interesting, you mentioned that. So I do actually, what you're describing is very similar to my first encounter with the Ramayan. And uh, I actually have my, my childhood versions here, yeah. which I can just show very briefly on screen. It's written and it's very, as you mentioned, it's a very thin <laughs> book and it's in two parts. This is the other one. Um, I've had these for 30 odd years. I had an uncle bring them back for me from India. And uh, yeah, everything that you describe is exactly um, how I felt about the series as a child. Like there were, there was just some magic to it. There were things that I didn't understand at the time and maybe some things that I still don't fully grasp, you know? So um, it, it is really a remarkable story and it is so, so beautifully illustrated in these pages, um, not unlike your version. Yeah. Um, I, I guess at first maybe growing up in the West with no connection to India also as a landscape, you know, and, and the people living there, like the story maybe was even more mysterious to us because like, the, like 
there, there was no dots to connect like what we were reading or, or looking at. So maybe this is also why like the mystery keep coming back at me. Right. Yeah. Was there a moment or a spark that told you this is something I need to do? That this is something that I need to dedicate my time, energy and uh, effort towards? No, of course it was not as simple, but uh, I remember back in 2012 or 2013, I still had a day job at the time and I was doing my photographic projects on the side. Um, and then I quit my job. And at the same time, I decided to start working on, on the Ramayana project. Um, and I remember very well my first trip in India because it was kind of a disaster because I was going there without any, um, I only had the book with me and I had no assistant. And I was thinking that everybody would speak English in the countryside, which of course was not the case. And I was there all alone for months and it felt like a very uh, lonely experience because I, I was not really able to interact with people, although I was meeting with people and, and we were communicating not using words, um, but this was a very interesting first trip because I came back to France uh, looking at the pictures that were, uh, most of them were not good, of course. Um, and this is when I realized that if I wanted to do this, I should like do it on the long run and not be uh, in a rush or not trying to wrap it up in like three or four trips because this is this was not possible because the story was too complex and too long and although I had Sri Lankan Woods like as mentioned earlier like growing up in France I had no like I was a complete foreigner in India even if I was not a complete foreigner because like my father Woods are there but so it was uh, uh, I think like the position I was in as a human being, as a photographer, like being a foreigner and not a foreigner at the same time was um, at the same time a blessing and at the same time a curse because like one could feel a bit of uh, like wh why am I the one doing this, you know, like it should be an Indian photographer doing this or so many questions were popping up um, all over like uh, every trip, like there were new questions um but i just took one trip at a time i think like this was like why i managed to to do it in in the long run that really i that really resonates with me you know we i was born in canada primer was born in the uk and you know we even on the many trips that we've taken to india we feel really canadian when we're there um so i that yeah, I'm glad to know that that's not just a feeling that uh, Harmbir and I share. I feel like a foreigner everywhere, so that's... Yeah, yeah. It's a sentiment that we share with you. For sure. And Indians can quickly, I don't know how they do it so quickly, but they notice the gate or the stance they and just... they can identify where you're from before you say a word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then, uh, they want, and then they want to know all about you, so that's the... <laughs> You know, what you just described, completing a project of this magnitude, reminded me of an exhibition I saw in 2014 at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I know there are a number of um, people tuning in from the AGO. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Anastasia. Hi, photography curatorial community. Mm -hmm. um, it, the exhibition was about Michelangelo and the highs and lows of this creative process. And so it is really interesting to hear that, you know, your first trip there, um, it sounds like maybe it was maybe it was a low point, um, you know, in this entire process. And, uh, you know, I understand this took eight years to complete 13 trips to India, Nepal and Sri Lanka. And you retrace the route of the protagonist over 3500 miles, which you very rightly so describe as your own epic journey. Did you it sounds like maybe after the first trip, but maybe before you even took this on, did you have any idea this was going to take almost a decade to complete? No, not at all. I think I wouldn't have started it like if I knew at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it also has to do, you know, when you, 
when you're a young artist, I think that sometimes you start think like, because you're, you're naive, because it comes with like the territory, you know, you're young. So you don't really know what you're getting into because if the same idea had come to mind at 40 years old, maybe, you know, like for many different reasons, I would have thought, you know, like this is too big or like this couldn't be done. And, and because I was very young, I like, was just like, 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 let's do it. And I think that for me, picking the Ramayana as the, um, as the entry to India was um, a way to give um, meaning to my trips and to the journey because just traveling to India um, with a camera uh, would still be like going there as a tourist, you know, like, because how do you go beyond the surface and dig deeper and try to build meaningful like connections with the people you doing portraits with, for example. Um, and I think that the, I wanted to, to do something with the Ramayan and, and right from the start, I knew that it was an impossibility, so to speak, because how does one illustrate with pictures uh, words and a kind of a treasure, like uh, in terms of literature. And um, the, the, the pictures can very quickly be only an illustration of the world. And if this is the case, then the project uh, is not successful because the pictures should be sitting there and the world there and the two should interact with each other. And this is something like combining pictures and words together, um, be it in a photography book or be it um, on the walls during an exhibition, for example, um, it's something very difficult to achieve. Like it's much more simple to build a photo book that is only made of pictures because like everything is at the same level and there is like, uh, a way for the reader to interact with the material and, and for the two materials, text and words to overlap each other in meaningful connection is, is very difficult. So I think that for me, it was also like the challenge. Right. Um, again, because maybe I was very young, like there, there was this kind of challenge of trying something that was uh, meant to fail, like, like th that was impossible to do. Yeah. There are so many layers to this project, as you point out, and um, and getting them all to uh, to blend together as beautifully as you have, I can see that that was um, a, a huge challenge that you've surmounted. Um, I wanted to actually just comment very quickly on something tangential that you said, but this idea of travel and experiencing a place um, is something that we think about a lot. When we go somewhere, we don't want to um, be passive and moving aimlessly, aimlessly through that place. We're always trying to think about um, how to uh, you know, create focus and meaning in, in places that we're visiting. So that really resonated with me that you used this epic tale as a way to focus your trips um, when you were visiting South Asia. Yeah, I think something that we should mention because of like the, the people who are listening at the moment, um, I'm sure live mostly in the West and are not necessarily familiar with the epic or with India for the matter. Um, but in India, um, everybody knows the Ramayan. And when I say everybody, it means Muslim people, Christian people, Hindu people, like it goes beyond religion because like, the story is also associated with uh, very important festivals during the year, like Diwali, um, Dushera, like many, many of the most important festivals where everyone is participating, uh, in fact, um, retellings uh, of the story. So um, connecting with people, like speaking with the Indians, um, about like that character or that moment of the story was a great way for me to connect with them. Right, what a great, there's no better icebreaker really yeah. than the Ramayan. So what I'm hearing then is that you're seeing this as not a religious text so much as a, uh, an Cultural. odyssey or yeah. something similar to Homer's works. That's right. That relates yeah. to human behavior and um, sort of our challenges, our, um, our successes, but also our personal defeats. Yeah. And, um, 
obstacles. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that, for example, like the, the so of course because the text was written two thousand years ago, it's written from a male perspective and from a, like there is many things like in the original text that are uh, very patriarchal. Um, right. And, and it's very interesting to see that for like 20, the last 20, 30 years, like um, many Indian women writers have been writing like new updated version of the Ramayana uh, from Sita's point of view. So from, from the princess point of view. So it's a good example of, of like, maybe the text was, um, has a lot of, of problems into it, you know, like if we were to read it um, today in 2022, um, but it's still relevant because like people can take it and do a new version today and try to speak to yeah deeper meanings. And if it is a text that's supposed to transcend one faith, then suddenly it becomes important to update it with uh, in a way that becomes meaningful for the people at that time. Right. I, I like the idea that this was started off as a um, as an oral story. Yeah, it really is a living, a living document, as you said at the outset, Vasantha. So, Vasantha, I wanted to go back to why you, 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 you discussed some of the tension that you encountered trying to capture this in your photographic style um, and the, the challenge that you set up for yourself, but yet you continued with it. Mm -hmm. And I, you, you felt that it was the right way forward. And I want to sort of dwell on that a little bit deeper. Um, so why do you think that photography is a well-suited uh, medium for retelling uh, the story of the Ramayana? As we see these stunning photographs know, on the screen. Um... Yeah, I, I mean, I think that photography was the perfect medium because for me, photography is a way to work with, to experience the world and to work with reality, yet finding yourself um, coming back home with a material um, pictures um, that can then be edited, sequenced, uh, reworked in the studio um, to build up new meanings um, and, and to build up fiction from reality. And so that space um, is for me where photography is the most uh, powerful. Um, so this is why, for example, um, Marjorie mentioned in the introduction that the, the project blends uh, staged photography. So photography I was um, staging with people I would meet and we would do portraits together and we would find location and everything was sort of set as if I were uh, a movie director, you know, like we would like cast people and we would find location and everything was very controlled. And some other time, like because India is a country where everything can happen, really, um, yeah. I I would I would see something in the street that would like deeply resonate with some episode with the Ramayana, like in my head, of course, because like I was looking at the landscape with that in mind all the time, um, and that everyday life scene uh, is as strong for me than a stage scene. Like there is no one is no, no more important than the other. And I think that uh, as a photographer, I feel that the art world is some, sometimes um, as difficulty to grasp with photography because it's much more simple to explain something that is staged, you know, so like Jeff Wall pictures or Cindy Sherman picture, like I, I love their work, you know, like I don't have any problem with staged photography, but somehow, something that is uh, more direct in terms of you are there and you see something and you take a picture and people might think that it is more easy or that it is more simple, but it is not really not. Um, and using both was a way for me to kind of try and pick the best of the two worlds, you know, like sometimes like you have an ID and and why not stage it, you know, like if, right. if the moment is right and if the, the landscape and the people are there, like why not do it, you know, like you should, you should just try it. But then like, if you only do that for me, the danger 
is that it is you as a photographer that uh, that you are kind of imposing you are like saying to the world this is my id and you are saying to the people you are working with like do this and do that and so like you are less open to what the world can offer um so being open is something like that i always want to stay aware of because i think that this this is what photography is very good at like 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 uh, you should go to a place and the place will teach you things right things that you don't know you know so like you cannot be like in the studio and try to plan for everything and then apply to reality what your plan was because right. then it's not going to work this is interesting because i like to have a plan um, but i'm also very much okay with deviating from the plan as long as i have a place to start from so um, I, I definitely get the sense from uh, from what I've seen of the series that you know it has was a very collaborative undertaking for you, which is wonderful. Um, I guess that brings me to my next question, and you've talked about this a little bit: uh, the figures in your images um, and the process for getting them to perform certain parts of the story. You've sort of talked about some of it being staged and uh, some of it being uh, very free flowing. Yeah. Is there a character in particular? in the Ramayan um, or in your retelling that really resonates with you? Yeah, I would say Sita, of course, because like okay. also, also because um, as a foreigner first or as a man first and a foreigner second, it was very difficult to photograph women in India. Right. Especially um, when you travel outside of Mumbai and Delhi in the countryside, things are still very uh, different from, from like, everybody is, is, is looking and seeing India like as, a, as China, you know, as like a country that is moving very, very quickly uh, towards like um, the Western world. Um, but the reality in the villages is, is of course very different. Uh, and for many different reasons, like it's, it's hard for, for men to, to take pictures of women. So every time, like the few times like I could do it was very special because every man in India wants to be photographed. You know, like if you walk the street and especially because I was working with a large format camera that is a very big, big camera, like, like someone would see you in the street like a hundred meters. Um, so everyone was always like coming at me and like let's do a picture you know so it was very simple <laughs> with men and very difficult with women okay. um, and and the character of sita as well um, in the epic is is i think the most interesting yes that's interesting that you mentioned that because i even think about my experiences in india um i went to india for the first time in 2008 i was with my mother and i have a younger brother and you know, even thinking about our experience in Mumbai uh, versus New Delhi, and then going back two years later with Parm Bear, who at the time was my fiance, and and how and and just noting how different my experience was, even in those two cities, um, just depending on who I was traveling with. Um, so that's that makes a lot of sense to me that you're saying as you get further away from city centers um, that presents new challenges in, in your work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think there is an older, like, you know, Gandhi said like that famous saying, you know, like you will find India in the villages, you know, like he said that, yes. and I think that's one of the most famous quotes from Gandhi. And, and he was so right, I mean, like, because when you travel to the deeper countryside, you find something that is slowly disappearing in Bombay and Delhi, I feel, you know, because like the way the city are going is just very fast and, and everything is kind of disappearing without any second thought of like, oh, should we, should we preserve that, you know, should we That's right. like not destroy that building to build like a condo over it or like, so in the big cities, India is, is is of course changing very at a very fast pace, but in the villages, like so, maybe the traditions in the villages also they stay alive longer, or like the kind of like they they are remains of the Ramayan that linger um, a little bit more, I think, in the countryside. 
Yeah, I think that cities, and you're so right to say that, regionality and specificity um, are, are leaving us and, and, and large cities all over the world are becoming more homogenous, so. I, I want to just focus for a moment on these stunning pictures that, that yeah. Marjorie's flipping through on the, uh, um, in the slideshow. Yeah. Uh, and there's a very distinctive, palpable sense of color and light in the series as a whole. Is that a personal style for you, Vasanta, or something that you felt was dictated by the narrative or nature of retelling a myth? Now, we were just recently in the south of France and we were thinking about similarities between your palette and that region. We were absolutely gobsmacked by the landscape and the geography and, and the palette um, of the south of France. And we were thinking about your work a lot while we were there. Yeah, you know, I see, I mean, I see color as some, something as important as light or form or shapes or like the content of the picture itself. I think that like, I'm much more influenced by paintings than photography. So like, I mainly look like every week also because Instagram has made things like much more easier, you know, like you, you discover new painters, young painters on Instagram, like in every country in the world which is something that you couldn't do like only 10 years ago, you know? So I'm always looking at paintings and especially at the moment, like there is a new wave of uh, figurative paintings that right. many young artists are doing amazing works. Um, many of them coming from Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting to see that although many, many times um, people said like figurative painting is, is done, you know, it's dead, you know, like what, what can you do, you know, like everything's been done. And yet this young artist in 2022, they find a new palette, you know, they find a new yes. light or they find a new way to depict like simple scenes that that been depicted for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, traveling to India, color was a very, um, important matter because India has been known for its colors um, to who like the, the history of art, you know, like and especially with photography, uh, like the photojournalism from the 50s and the 60s relied like heavily on the use of like high contrast and very vivid saturated colors. Um, and the India experience uh, was not only about like very vivid colors, but also about more pastel use, like light morning, uh, blue evenings. Um, and, and every time I was traveling, like um, color was, uh, was always with me because for me, like um, it's funny with photography, like because like many of the best uh, well-known photographers were working or are working with black and whites. Um, and they all have a signature style, you know, like some have like high contrast black and white or some others like work with only grays, you know, like very soft, very like subtle black and white. And I feel that like the, there's um, a lot of experience uh, to make with colors and photography because like, of course the photographer is working with the palette of the real world. So it's not like a painter, you know, you're not like in the studio and right. you can say like, oh, I want this tree to be purple, you know, like the tree is not purple in the reality. But then if you look longer and if you stay longer, maybe at some point in the day, the tree will look like a little bluer. You right. know, you just have to stay there and, and try to, connect with the landscape and, and with color uh, in a more deeper way. Uh, and, and one last thing I should mention because like the pictures we're looking at at the moment, uh, many of them are hand painted uh, by a local Indian painter. His name is Jekumar Shankar. Um, he's around uh, 50, 55, I think. Okay. living in is living in New Delhi and he comes from a family of painter. Um, when I say family of painter, I mean a family of painter that were only painting over photographs. Okay. So they were not painters, like they were not painting anything else. They were painting uh, Bollywood movies in the fifties. Um, wow. Basically everything that was before color film was invented and when there was only black and white film available. 
um, this art of uh, hand tinting that was uh, very popular in Asia, in Japan, India, um, was very important um, because it was a way for these artists, I believe, to say something about the world through colors, you know, because they were not the ones creating the pictures. They were, they were painting over other people's creations. So I think that for them, color was really um, very important because this was the, their world was only about colors. And so when I met with Jekuma like in 2015, uh, very quickly the idea of uh, shooting some of the pictures and of, in black and white and handing them, uh, handing him black and white prints for him to do whatever he wanted to do um, uh, came to mind, you know, and it has been like a, a relationship with him that's been going on for the past six years. And it's been a blessing because like, I learned so much uh, about color with him that uh, I think it, it was very important for the project as well, as well. It was a kind of renewal for me as an artist. That's wonderful. You um, took the words out of my mouth because my next question was about Jay Kumar and uh, you know your use of painted photography. And I guess one thing that I'll mention, um, that question and my next question are sort of about how you've subverted the myth. And so historically, painted photography has been reserved for wealthy patrons. And meanwhile, you've used it in the series without consideration of caste or status, which is really wonderful. Um, it sounds like you gave him carte blanche to, uh, to work on uh, your photographs uh, as he saw fit. Um, one question that I thought of as we're talking about color and light, how did, if at all, how did the palette change from, for example, North to South India, uh, throughout Sri Lanka, throughout Nepal, did you notice any major differences in in the colors or palette that you saw as you were traveling throughout these countries oh yes of course it's i mean it's very different not india like i was only traveling there during the winter time okay um, so something people don't really know is that winter time in the north of india is very cold and because of pollution there is this fog that kind of stays uh during the morning like from six to like 10 ish 11. Um, and using film, like the fog, like you can turn it in a kind of pinky violet oh, wow. fog, okay. you know, so like the first pictures Marjorie was showing at the beginning, they were all shot in uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar um, during the very early hours uh, of the morning. Uh, and I remember these two trips very vividly because it was like uh, walking in a dream, you know, like you would take a rickshaw, like start like when it was still like very, very like morning uh, time and, and the fog would not dissipate, you know, like, I mean, in France, like there is fog in the morning when it's the winter time and it's humid and like, if you're by a lake, you will see like some clouds and, but like it lasts for 30 minutes, you know? So like, it's kind of a very beautiful uh, morning thing to experience but in India because the fog like lingers for like four or five hours like it makes you uh, interact with the landscape and walk uh, as if you like it's very disorienting you know like you, you like there, there are no boundaries anymore uh, the, the sky and the sea blends together um, and people roam the landscape and you only see like kind of silhouettes uh, figurines, you know, like shadows, like walking the landscapes with so very, uh, it's a kind of dreamlike experience. Um, and in the south of India, like the light is more vivid, you know, like it's more like crisp and sharp and, 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 but very light as well, very beautiful. Incredible. There's so much of, uh, of India and South Asia that we both still have to see. So, Yes. I'm thinking about all of this and one of the things that comes back, I keep coming back to my head, is that this journey, your first encounter with India, 
um, the initial sort of challenges, the chaos, the length of time that it took you. Uh, and then the purpose of these tales is to learn about human nature, to, just, uh, to teach a child right versus wrong and a moral code. But you experience, you lived this. And so yeah. how, do, do you, how do you think you changed during this, this journey? This... A lot for sure, because I started when I was 28, finished when I was 36. So it's also years where I think as a human being, you change a lot, you know, perhaps even more than between your 45 and 50, for example, you know, and so also as an artist and as a photographer, like I was, uh, I was going through some change in the way I was interacting with people and taking pictures. Um, so the way I was taking pictures, say, tip number one was very different than for tip number 10, you know? So like everything was uh, an evolution and I, I keep, um, I kept wanting to keep it flowing, you know, like as life is flowing and try to make, try to force myself out of my comfort zone and try to experience with, for experience, new cameras, new cameras, uh, sorry. So for ex like, it, it sounds like a geeky, uh, no. thing, but it would be like for a painter, it would be, you know, like switching from oil painting to acrylic, you know, and, 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 and the two are very different mm -hmm. because the way you paint is different with oil and acrylic and the way you photograph with a large format camera that is um, put on a tripod uh, is very different than the way you would photograph with a small Leica, you know? So like the way you move, the way you interact with people is different. So every few trips, um, if I was getting used and if I was getting uh, too comfortable, uh, feeling too good about using a camera, I would like put it in the drawer and leave with another camera that I was wow. really, uh, unused, unused of um, and try to start new, you know? So like there was this kind of, to keep it entertaining, like also for the readers to try to make pictures that would be not the same right. over and over, you know? A form of self, um, uh, self-imposed uh, humility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. just a lovely confidence in all of this and you've done a tremendous job we're at a great juncture um at the slideshow uh chapter seven Amma um brings me kind of to my next question here you know we've talked about the ramayan being a living document with numerous adaptations and i was wondering are there any major departures from sage valmiki's version um sort of some creative freedom that you've taken I get the sense that in your version, there's a recasting um, of and a redemption for the women in the story, uh, Sita, as we talked about, but also the demon sister, Ravana, um, Rab uh, Ravana's sister, uh, yes. Sarbanka, as well. So I was wondering if there were any um, yeah, they are, they are, they are creative many. license you've taken. Yeah. Yeah, there are many because I think it's, it's not. Um it's not a remake, it's a retelling, and there is a difference between the two that like it's it's important. I think that from chapter one to chapter seven, chapter one follows very closely the original text and chapter seven is, is very far away from the original one. And I think it also speaks volume about me um, finding more freedom, you know, in the way I would as a photographer, as an artist, take that story and make it my own. And so Ama, like the last chapter is by far, like I think my, my favorite book of the series because like it's kind of all the project, everything I learned like is, is there and like there is uh, a lot of freedom in the way the epilogue, in the way the conclusion and, uh, of the epic uh, is, is retold uh, to the readers. Uh, especially from Sita's point of view and, mm -hmm. and, and the way she in, she's acting towards Rama because Rama um, is making Sita go to um, hell, like really at the end of the epic. It's very, like, very, it's very tough uh, what's happening to the woman. Um, 
so it was very uh, yeah liberating to to find another way to to retell it that's wonderful we both look forward to delving into it more deeply last question um a myth of two souls can you tell us about where the title came from well, for sure, it 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 comes. It's coming from like so. The first or two trips, I was doing interviews as well um, of people, and I interviewed uh, many couples about the um, like their links to Rama and Sita and and the love Rama and Sita shares in the epic. Um, and someone like a woman told me, you know, like that the Ramayana it's not only about the physical body and, and the life we live in at this current, current moment, speaking on Zoom, like the four of us, it's that like you are living seven lives. So Indians think that you are here, like that you are going to reincarnate um, for another six, six other lifetime, you know, like let's say that this is our first one. Uh, we have six more to go, so that's a good, um, good thing. <laughs> I guess. Um, and when you marry someone, when you find your true love, when you find your soulmate, you are not only not only with her or with him for this life, but for the next six. Mm -hmm. So this is why like she was referring it as the wedding and 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 choosing someone um, that it's 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 a myth of two souls, as in you know, like the souls are connecting even across death and across like to the other life. So it comes from there. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful sentiment to finish on. Yeah. Thank you, Masata. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those were really excellent questions. We have um, a few questions um, queued up. So I will read them. Um, our first one says, as an Indian Canadian who has returned to India after 15 years to pursue photography, your work is extremely inspiring, Vasantha. Um, her question, their question is, in your low moments, how did you ground yourself? What made you keep coming back again to pursue this um, project? Uh, it's without falling into the cliche of, of an artist having to be a bit crazy i think you still have to be a bit crazy you know because you're like especially photography is a very um it's solitary you know like it's not like i don't know if you work in the, in, in the, the the world of cinema like you have a crew you know like like the, they're like giant teams like working on a movie together and i'm sure that when someone is done someone is there to lift you up, you know, but we, with photography, like you go to the ups and downs yourself. And so it's it, like, it's, it's, it's very different. Like it's very difficult, I guess, that you only have to try and, and stay confident in yourself and what you're trying to achieve, because of course you're not going to success uh, every time, you know, like, by the way, like for me, like, and I think many other photographers, um, said it as well uh, photography is mainly about failure so for example i've been wow. uh, i've been uh, working on a new project in new orleans uh, in the us for the past summer as part of a, of a residency and this is going to lead to an exhibition next year in in, uh, in the united states uh, at the international center of photography in new york um, and i took more than 2000 photographs in New Orleans over three months. And I think maybe 60 are good. So it's like, it's maybe 3%, wow. like three, three and a half percent. And, but of course, when you're in the moment and you're taking photographs, like each time you press the shutter, you think what you're capturing is good or what you're trying to capture is worth it, you know? But then you see the picture and it doesn't, like the magic is not there, you know? So like, it's it's very interesting because it's like that fleeting, um, that fleeting quality of photography because it doesn't matter if you stage something or if you doesn't stage something, still most of the pictures, you know, are gonna be taken at a half of a second, you know? So like, so like it's, it's quicker than what the human eye can see or can look at. Um, 
and it's it kind of like elicits like the understanding of the world and the medium the photographer can can have you know even after 10 15 20 years working with the medium every time you step out of your house and you interact and experience real life like you're gonna fail you know like and this is what makes it interesting wow absolutely um the next question is for Anjali and Parambir. Uh, as thoughtful collectors with a real vision for your collection, how do you know when an artwork should find a home with you? If you can distill it, what about Vasantha's uh, project, A Myth of Two Souls, struck most personally and compelled you um, to support him and collect the work? Oh, that's such a great question. Um... You know, I, f I feel that our conversation today with you, Vasantha, confirmed so much of what we felt about um, the work of yours that we've seen, this particular project, you know, talking about um, our upbringing and, and how that brought us to encounter this myth. Um, there are so many parallels there, uh, you know, and that some of that is what made this work so compelling for us, uh, you know, not just to simply objectify your work, but the, the photographs are so beautiful. Um, you know, there is just sort of, uh, it, it just this, you know, these washes of color. Um, you know, I, I know you've said that, you know, there is an evolution between uh, book one and book seven and the photographs that are, that comprise these volumes. But I think there is also a real, real consistency to the entire body of work. And, um, you know, I guess for me, uh, just personally, it's something that I really, really uh, aspire to, you know, to have, to have such a, a consistent vision. Um, I think it's really wonderful to, to bring a contemporary spin to, um, you know, an, an epic that is thousands of years old and, uh, and, and to really, also get to the heart of um, maybe some of its problematic uh, elements that we talked about, you know, the, the patriarchal nature, um, you know, and, and even the tension that exists between the casting of who the good guy is, what is that person's nationality, who the bad guy is, what is that person's nationality, I'm, I'm glad that we can get to the heart of, um, um, of how the story is told. Uh, as far as how, how do works find their way into our collection? That's a great question as well. Um, I, I see this as, a, as a, a masterpiece. It's really visually stunning, yeah. but it's also very relevant. And it's, um, I cannot think of any other uh, photographic retellings of uh, the Ramayan that um, in recent times, uh, the recasting of, uh, uh, Sita in a different light. I am um, resonates with us and with most yeah. of the audience, I'm sure. Um, so it, it just checked a lot of different boxes, and that um, yeah, it, you don't. It's funny, but you'll know when a work is right for you. Yeah, it. Does, it yeah, I, we, I don't want to be. I don't want to obfuscate and seem deceptive, but yeah, there's you know sometimes it almost picks you versus you picking it. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes it's hard to put into words. Um, yes. But yeah. I think you did a great job. Um, so the next question is for me. Um, someone asked if you can share a few installation views of the gallery and talk a bit about the work selected for the space um, and the thematic arrangement. So maybe Basanta, you and I can um, tag team this question a bit, but um, maybe I can just spin my screen a bit. Um, yes. There are three walls in our space, um, which is, as you may have guessed from hearing more about the project, really not a lot of space to show um, such a monumental and such an epic project. Um, so it really was a fun challenge to figure out how, what version of the story, how to, how to tell um, this story in, in, in our space. Um, so Vasantha, if you want to speak a little bit about the kind of thematic arrangement that we came up with. Um, feel free to do that. Sure. Um, so I think that the Ramayan is, uh, we didn't really uh, 
tell the audience about it, but it's a very uh, long journey, you know, from the north of India to Sri Lanka. It's, um, it's many different locations, um, but mainly the, there are three worlds. Uh, there is the city, there is the jungle, and there is the sea. Um, and as you follow Rama and Sita's footsteps, you go from the city to the jungle to the sea, and then back to the city at the end and then back to the jungle. Anyway, uh, so the, 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 the exhibition is loosely um, connecting the dots between these three worlds uh, because we had three worlds and we thought that it would be a good, um, yeah, a good way to, to, to do it also because each world um, has its own color palette. Um, and so you go from like a kind of beige and, and pinkish hues in the city to the, to the more vivid lush green of the jungle, uh, to the whitewashed um, seashore of Sri Lanka. Um, and so the, the, the works are loosely um, put in that order. And then I think that within uh, the gallery space, um, it's interesting because of course you cannot hope for the people to understand um, the entire story, you know, because you can only show so much, maybe 15, 20 works. Um, so for me as a photographer, like I hope that the people will then uh, find their way to the books um, and that they can, it's, it's a way for them to enter the space and the space like the imaginary space that is the Ramayan and to, yeah, just open a window. Uh, for, for the visitors uh, to this world. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question, and this is related to uh, what you were saying about the photographs that you took in New Orleans and, and how many you felt uh, were, were great shots at the end. Yeah. How many photographs are in the seven volumes and, and how many photographs do you think you took overall, which you then narrowed down and distilled? So the seven volumes, the total is 437. And I didn't, I didn't count how many photographs. <laughs> I did that's... 13 trips, yeah, yeah. Too, wow. Too many, too many. Too many. <laughs> yeah. One quick note also about the installation to Vasantha is that it's really interesting to see visitors once they read the text and realize that it is a retelling of a narrative they are definitely trying and having a lot of fun with, I think, like making linear connections or trying to mm -hmm. make connections between different um, and telling their own stories in their head, I think, which um, I think is kind of the spirit of the project. So it's been really um, exciting to have conversations with people being like, is this the same person in this photo? And kind of really getting into, into the world and into the myth. Um, and so I, that's been really exciting um, for me. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, the last one is for Vasantha and someone wants to know, um, your father being from Sri Lanka, when you visited, when you visited yourself, did you find, feel a connection? Is there any special photograph that you took there, um, because of this relationship? Oh, sure. There is one actually, there is one taken in, uh, in the North of Sri Lanka in Jaffna, where my father is coming from. Um, and it's in chapter six, uh, the one at night, like the, the one chapter that's titled Afterlife. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a father holding his, his boy, his, um, his son. And this picture really resonates with me for many obvious reasons, but like when the scene happened, it was not staged and it was happening at night. So I was shooting with a flash so at night with a flash, like you're really not in control and you just hope for the best. And it was, uh, it was very beautiful to see that the picture was there on the contact sheets when I came back to France. That's lovely. Um, okay, uh, in the interest of everyone's Saturdays, uh, I think we're gonna wrap up there. Thank you again um, so much to our amazing panelists. Um, that was really, really engaging and enlightening. Um, and thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vasanta. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Parambia.
Thank, Thank you. you. And, um, as one final note, um, I'd like to mention that um, we've been recording this conversation and it will be up on our website soon if you'd like to revisit it. Um, and our website, assembly.art, is also where you can get in touch with us um, and find updates about upcoming exhibitions and events like this one. Um, our next exhibition, Creatures of the Grind, will feature new work by Rodrigo Valenzuela, and that is opening November 18th. Um, so we hope you'll stay tuned um, and come to the opening if you're in Houston. Um, and I think that is all for today. I hope everyone um, enjoys their Saturdays. Um, and thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye. 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 Have a good day.